Uh, welcome to the 11th annual Pinkle, uh, uh, Benjamin and Ann Pinkle Endowed Lecture. Uh, the Pinkle Endowed Lecture Series was established through a generous gift from uh, Sheila Pinkle on behalf of the state, uh, state of her parents, um, uh, Benjamin and Ann Pinkle. The series serves as a memorial tribute to their lives. Uh, Benjamin Pinkle received a bachelor's degree uh, in electrical engineering here uh, from the University of Pennsylvania in 1930, and throughout his life, he was actively interested in the philosophy of the mind and published a monograph in 1992 uh, entitled Consciousness, Matter, and Energy, uh, the Emergence of Mind in Nature. Uh, the objective of the book was, uh, and I quote, a re-examination of the mind-body problem in light of new scientific information. The lecture series is intended to advance the discussion and rigorous study of the deep questions which engage Dr. Pinkle's investigations. Over the last 10 years, uh, the series has brought in some of the most interesting minds uh, in the field of cognitive science uh, as it pertains to thought, learning, uh, and consciousness. Uh, these include Daniel Dennett, Liz Spelke, uh, Martin Nowak, uh, Stan DeHane, uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, Ray Jackendoff, uh, Colin Kammerer, Alyssa Newport, and Christoph Koch. Uh, it's great pleasure to add to this list uh, Dr. Alvia, uh, Alvaro uh, Pascal Leon, uh, who will be speaking about uh, uh, modifying decision making. Uh, Dr. Pascal Leon uh, is the director of the Center for Non Invasive Brain and Stimula Stimulation and professor of neurology at Harvard, uh, the Harvard Medical School, and the Beth Israel Medical School uh, Medical Center. He also holds appointments as an adjunct professor in psychiatry and neurobiology at Boston University and in cognitive neuroscience at, uh, at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. Uh, he's also the associate director of the Harvard uh, Thorndike General Clinical Research Center. Uh, Dr. Pascal Leon uh, was born in Valencia, Spain, uh, and attended medical school and completed his PhD in neurophysiology at the University of Valencia uh, and at uh, the Albert Lud Ludwigs University in Freiburg, Germany. Uh, he received his neurobiology training at the University of Minnesota, where he, was also, where he also completed a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology. He spent four years at the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke in Bethesda, uh, 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 the Neurological Disorders and Stroke Institute at, at National Institute in Bethesda, Maryland and joined the Harvard Medical School uh, after working in Spain for four years as an associate professor in physiology at the University of Valencia. Uh, as stated on his website, uh, Dr. Pascal Leon's overall aim in his res research is to understand the neuroplasticity, uh, understand neuroplasticity at a systems level by seeking rules of plasticity that are invariant across uh, neural systems and domains. Uh, he's made great strides in doing uh, this via careful and very creative experiments uh, on this topic, uh, such as examining the response of the visual cortex uh, in the blind and even modifications in the response of visual areas in visually uh, unimpaired people uh, who have been temporarily blindfolded. Uh, it should be noted that uh, Dr. Pascal Leon uses a dizzying array of uh, techniques in his, his research, including PET, fMRI, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, EEG, and MEG. Uh, uh, but as I hope will be clear from uh, his, the talk today, uh, his work rarely, if ever, loses sight of the forest from all the data trees that uh, these devices generate. In fact, I find many of his papers quite accessible for people who are novices in, in these uh, technical devices. Uh, so uh, because of this, he's received numerous awards uh, for his work uh, uh, on these topics. Uh, but without any further delay, uh, let's welcome Dr. Alvaro, Alvaro Pascal Leon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Um, Turn this away so we can... Thank you very much, uh, John, and, and all of you and, and the Pinkle family. Um, it is a, a, a pleasure to, to be here, and, and uh, um, I hope that. that um, what I was, um, what I'm planning on, on telling you will be will be interesting um, to to you. I, I'm a neurologist uh, from training, and so uh, I tend to approach cognitive neuroscience with the ultimate aim of 
translating it to patient populations. And, and uh, I think that um, um, one challenge that we have as a cognitive uh, neuroscience community is actually to, to try to do that and, and uh, to, to try to explore ways by which we can um, really meaningfully illuminate um, sort of clinical interventions that oftentimes uh, lack behind the insights that we have from cognitive neuroscience and that could benefit from, from greater cognitive neuroscience uh, guidance. But oftentimes the leap to the clinic uh, fails to, to be done. And so what I, what I would like to do is uh, start with, whoop, start with um, a problem of uh, the, the, the neurobiology and cognitive neuroscience of, of decision making and, and try to make the argument that some of what we're learning um, can be meaningfully translated to patient populations around uh, the topics of uh, drug abuse and, and obesity. Now, the idea of, of how to deal with the fact that we as humans are really bad at making up our mind and making a right decision is by no means new, by no means unique of, of uh, neurobiology is broadly in the popular press now, but it dates back uh, you know, as far back as people have started thinking about these, these issues. And, and uh, uh, arguably one of the um, first uh, sort of um, influential um, positions on, on what this decision-making uh, challenges is like uh, goes back to Plato, uh, who in Phaedrus um, described uh, the, chariot, uh, the chariot allegory to horses uh, drive us basically in opposite uh, ways, uh, one um, full of energy and impulse and uh, oftentimes uh, uh, yeah, uh, making a rush uh, to one direction and another one more thoughtful and, and calm and uh, um, making less uh, impulsive decisions and the challenge is how to control those two forces uh, so that the chariot ultimately moves forward rather than breaking pieces. I don't know about you, but um, I struggle with that. My 16-year-old struggled with that even more, and my 11-year-old hasn't realized yet what many struggles lie ahead. Um, and so the, the question is, you know, what uh, does that ultimately mean? Have we learned something and, and, uh, about this? And of course, many, many disciplines have addressed this, but uh, um, even social neuroscience now in the conceptualization of dual process uh, models uh, characterizing a reflexive versus a reflective system come remarkably close to, to what uh, uh, resonates in, in Plato in, with different terminologies. A reflexive system that has sort of automatic processes, is fast operating, is slow in learning, is phylogenetically older, is linked to brain structures that are largely subcortical in white and uh, very closely linked to emotional and, uh, and immediate reward processing versus a reflective system or a C system that is more controlled uh, processes, slow operating, it's uh, faster to learn, um, therefore also more plastic, um, phylogenetically newer, linked to cortical areas, and presumably particularly engaged in situations of uncertainty. And, and um, perhaps this is the one horse and the other horse of Plato with uh, a new novel characterization. Now, if, if you think about it from um, maybe more anthropological and uh, uh, I'm by no means an evolutionary uh, neuroscientist of any sort, but, uh, but uh, from sort of more humanistic point of view, arguably, contrary to the horse allegory, um, humans are, are rather unique in that we are able to really control under certain circumstances, seems to anyway, one of the horses, um, to the point of, of uh, going against what would be self-benefit. Um, uh, you know, altruism ultimately is uh, the true selfless uh, giving of oneself for others, to others for no secondary motives. And uh, um, in that sense, that humans are able to do that, albeit few are, um, we, we become in some sense true evolutionary outliers, seems like, in that we're driven not by the one horse and the uh, reflexive system motifs, but rather are able to control them to a very high degree. So what does that all mean in terms of, of uh, brain function and how can we try to, to disentangle that? More importantly, perhaps as a neurologist, if, if all that is, is sort of 
identifiable, could we go in and actually modify the amount of control that one system can exert onto the other? Because if we could, aside from illuminating the mechanisms that are at work, um, that might have meaningful applications to control my 16-year-old daughter um, and all the ethics that will come with it. But in addition to that, perhaps to control and help patient populations that, that have significant problems in, in that sort of a balance. Obviously, as you start thinking about the possibility of, of modifying behavior, human behavior and decision making to that degree, it becomes a, a real ethical issue uh, that, that you open up as well. And uh, I, I'm not going to spend much time in addressing it, but there are substantial issues to, to discuss as to what constitutes normal behavior, what uh, is appropriate and not appropriate to do, both from an experimental point of view and ultimately from an application point of view. So what, what do we know about all this? So I, I think that the, the way we started thinking about it is that if it is possible to control one form of um, decision making, call it impulsive or uh, reflexive for the time being, um, and overlay on it a control that takes into consideration sort of social norms and is more reflective, less impulsive, um, and fast learning, then perhaps the capacity that we're tapping on is that of an ability to inhibit more subcortical um, responses. Um, and of course, there is a whole like, extensive literature. This is just one summary uh, paper of one aspect of the literature that has argued that there are such sort of across modality inhibitory capacities of specific parts of the nervous system, particularly prefrontal cortex, lateral prefrontal cortex, and perhaps particularly the right uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, across tasks both in animals, in macaques, and in humans um, that require a stop signal or a no-go signal um, or a task switching where activity in those areas impose a control um, that allows for that switch, for that no-go to take place. Might it be that such a capacity of this sort of neural substrate is applied not only for specific tasks, but across decision-demanding uh, domains? So in order to address and explore this question, um, we paired up with uh, Ernst Fair and uh, Daria Noch um, did the, the work and, ex and explored the ultimatum game. Now, the ultimatum game um, is a neuroeconomics game that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a rather simple game. Uh, two people are uh, brought in and they are going to play with each other. One will be the proposer, the other one the responder. The proposer is given $20 or 20 Swiss francs. Um, and told um, he or she can offer um, a, or propose a way to split it. Anything goes. You can say, I'll keep 20 and give her nothing. Or you can say, I'll split it 10-10. Or uh, I'm generous, I'll give her 16 and keep four. Or whatever. Um, there are no restrictions. Um, the responder, on the other hand, can listen to the proposal and can accept it, in which case they'll both walk out of the room with whatever was uh, agreed upon, or can reject it, in which case neither one will get anything. That's the game. It's very simple. So I'll give you 20 and you propose. And most people at the beginning will say 12-8. Humans are not that generous. We generally don't split 10-10. We generally try to get some advantage of it, it seems like. Most of them, in the case of the responder, when they're offered eight and had 12 uh, um, against uh, them and so realize it's not quite even, still think, well, better eight than nothing. I'll take it. And so most people with 12-8 will accept, even though they will walk out of there thinking, I'm better off than with nothing, but the guy is not that nice. Um, however, if the offer is 16-4, then it gets interesting. How low are you willing to go to walk out of here with something when you came in with nothing in the face of what you perceive to be unfair? That's the quirks behind the ultimatum game. 
So basically, you have to balance your self-interest. I want to take off something um, against fairness, equity, and reciprocity principles. So how do we each balance this? Obviously, each one of us would balance it somewhat differently. Um, but as it turns out, from behavioral tasks, it's known that people will reject low offers, even if what is at stake is as high as three months their own income, which is quite baffling. Um, so um, maybe in these economic times, it may not be quite as much. But in Switzerland, this is what you get. Um, the rejection rates, when the offers are below 25%, will be about 80%. So most people will reject it. Will reject it even though they're doing something that will harm them. And so neuroeconomists have spoken about and written about altruistic punishment. We are, as human beings, willing to punish another um, for what we believe to be morally wrong, even if we're harming ourselves in the process. Now, San Fei um, and Jonathan Cohen did a, did a study some years ago looking at the brain activity in the responders and asking what brain activity is, involved, is, is uh, seen when people go and reject the offer. And what they found was essentially two main areas, the amygdala, the anterior cingulate, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the other hand. So certain subcortical structures of the quote-unquote reflexive system and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the reflective system. And they argue that uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which they found to be more strongly activated when the subjects were facing unfair offers as compared with when they were facing fair offers, was there to implement the altruistic punishment. So they say, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex is involved in the control of the emotional impulse to reject the unfair offers. What happens to us is that we get an unfair offer and our blood boils, and if you're a Spaniard particularly, and you say, no way, and yet then your prefrontal cortex, if you're lucky, will kick in and control you a little bit, give you a little bit of time, and then you'll still reject it. Um, so it's the cognitive control of the emotional impulse that is, dr drives you to the fairness goal. That's, that's how they interpret it. But of course, there is a, a different interpretation possible. And the different interpretation is that, in fact, the prefrontal cortex is there to inhibit the selfish impulse. So that rather than the first thing that comes being, no way that's unfair, the first thing that comes is, hey, I get four bucks. And then you go, wait, that's unfair. Uh, he's taking 16. And so the question is, what is the first impulse? Is the first impulse to take, even if it's unfair, because at least you have something? Or is the first impulse to reject because it's unfair? Um, if the first impulse is the selfish one, then what we need is the capacity to inhibit the selfish impulse under certain circumstances, in a sense, to enable what might be more morally appropriate behavior. Um, so that's the question that we were going after. And of course, um, consistent with the idea of the right prefrontal cortex implementing some sort of inhibitory control, we hypothesize that this is what goes on, that as humans, not very different from rats and certainly not very different from any other animal, the first impulse is to preserve yourself. And if you have um, food at your disposal, you'll reach out for it. If you have four bucks uh, and you had nothing, you'll reach out for it. And then, as a second elaboration, um, the cognitive control may kick in. So how did we go about sort of um, doing that? Well, if you disrupt the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the task, and if San Fei and Jonathan are correct, then the prediction would be that the disruption will essentially reduce the acceptance of unfair offers, um, the, un the acceptance rate of unfair offers, because the, um, that is the consequence of controlling your rejection impulse. Whereas if the lateral prefrontal cortex is actually suppressing the selfish impulses, then its disruption will lead to exactly the opposite. It will lead to faster acceptance of more offers because you basically are not able to reject it anymore. So we went about 
functional MRI, identifying the same areas that some uh, had identified, and then using TMS to target the, the areas. For the sake of those of you that are not familiar with TMS, uh, that stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is Tony Barker who developed the system as we currently use it. In a box like this, there's a bank of capacitors. They store an energy of a few thousand amperes. And using an electronic switch, they can be discharged in a matter of milliseconds into a stimulating coil. The shape of the stimulating coil, the geometry of it, determines the geometry of the magnetic field that is generated, and that in turn determines the focality of the current that you deliver. If you use a, an eight-shaped coil like this, and it's appropriately sized, it's small enough, then you can target an area of about the tip of a little finger, 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 centimeters or so. When you do that and target the motor cortex, uh, you will hopefully hear the click when the current passes. There you heard it. And if you look at his hand, his hand twitched. Um, so targeting the motor cortex, that current this depolarizes the neurons and leads to a descending volley contralateral that activates uh, the muscle and induces a movement. You could hopefully see that he's not grimacing in enormous pain. It is well tolerated. And if you're doing it right, it is safe. Uh, you do need to follow appropriate guidelines. Um, now you want to know, we want to know exactly where we are on the brain, not where we're holding the coil over the subject's head. And so what we do is we track the position of the subject's head and the coil with these cameras that are projecting infrared and, and reflecting it on these little balls. And we digitize the coil and the head registered to the subject's own MRI. And then as you're moving the coil around, it tells you where you're targeting on the subjects on brain MRI. You can go around it the other way around and define a region of interest on the MRI, and then when you are on that region, and only then will it trigger uh, the stimulation. So you can take the functional MRI of the subject and say, this is my region of interest. Now move the coil around. When I'm there, it will trigger the stimulation. Now we've done modeling, um, and I don't want to to bore you with too many physics details, but give you a little bit of sense of the, the issues that are involved. There are a number of technical issues involved. Um, there is a very strong current that, that you deliver, but you deliver it in a very rapid changing field so that you go from 0 to 2.5 Tesla of magnetic field in a matter of about 50 milliseconds. And, and so um, that very rapid rate of change determines an induced current field that is sufficient to depolarize neurons. It's not the magnetic field that does it, it's the induced current that does it. The magnetic field is basically just bridging the skin, the skull, and allowing you to get into the brain, essentially, with very little attenuation, so non-invasively. Um, depending on the exact tissue characteristics, as uh, Anthony Wagner has, has shown in the lab, the, the current distribution is different, and so you need to take into consideration the sulcal pattern of each individual, the presence of pathology or not, to be sure that you're really targeting the spot that you're targeting, but you can actually model that and be certain that you target the appropriate spot. Um, and um, if you do that, then there's things that we've learned as to what happens when you apply trains of stimulation. I've shown you what happens when you give one single stimulus. You depolarize the neurons. If it's in the motor cortex, the hand twitches. But if you apply the stimulation repetitively over any one area, depending on your frequency and pattern of stimulation, you leave the cortical area modified. Um, so you can apply a train of stimulation, say targeting this area, apply it at low frequency, one stimulus per second for um, 1,600 stimuli, and then after you've stimulated, the area is rendered depressed in its uh, level of activity. Whereas if you apply it in bursts of 20 hertz, the area is rendered hyperactive, uh, facilitated after you've stimulated. Um, now if you look at the effects carefully, like Tony Valero has done, 
you can see that the effects are not limited to the targeted region, but actually spread from the targeted region across neural networks based on the connectivity between the targeted region and a given area. So here, for example, we're targeting the visual parietal cortex that has a lot of connections to the splenial visual area, and those are in excitatory. So if you suppress the visual parietal cortex, you withdraw the excitation at a distance, and therefore there is a knock-on sort of transsynaptic suppression of the visual parietal cortex, of the visual splenial cortex. Whereas neighboring areas that don't have connections show no impact. So it is a tool to non-invasively modify activity in a given targeted area, either up or down, depending on your stimulation parameters, and through that targeted area affect a network depending on the connectivity. And in fact, the distant effect is very tightly coupled with the strength of the connections that, that exist. Now, if you, let me skip through this. If you want to know what the connectivity is in a given human individual, this was CAT experiments, um, you can combine TMS with functional imaging, target a given area with the TMS coil inside the MRI scanner, um, as done here by, by uh, Amira Medi and John Campodron, and look at the bold, evolved responses to the TMS itself. So you can see here that if you target the visual cortex, you can activate the visual cortex, you can transsynaptically activate subcortical areas, LGN, and you can activate a entire sort of visual path, uh, dorsal and ventral uh, stream uh, because of these transsynaptic effects. And of course, that way you can either study the connectivity or modify it by applying repetitive simulation to one or, or multiple areas. So let's go back to the ultimatum game. We've identified from the functional imaging study an area in the prefrontal cortex, the same one that Zanfe had shown. We can now use the TMS to guide the stimulation to that area and suppress the activity in that region. So what happens if you do that versus target the left side? Now, I didn't point it out, but in some phase case, and in fact in ours, there was activation in both prefrontal cortices. It's slightly more on the right than on the left, but it's bilateral. So we targeted the left versus the right versus sham stimulation. And you can see that the acceptance rate significantly increases when you suppress the right prefrontal cortex. Not only does the acceptance rate significantly increase, but subjects respond and accept significantly faster um, when you suppress the right prefrontal cortex. In other words, you tell them 16 4 and they go, yes, I'll take it. Um, that's contrary to the prediction that this is controlling your emotional um, response uh, because of the unfairness. Now, is that sufficient to be sure? Well, we, we wanted to, to take it a step further. And so, um, in the case of a human proposer, you're faced with the self-interest, on the one hand, of yourself to keep whatever you have. Um, and you have to balance that against the fairness and reciprocity principles related to this other fellow that just came into the lab with you and, and it's doing something that you think is not right. Um, because... As it turns out, when playing with this proposer, you just accept it, but you still thought that this was an incredibly unfair thing that the person was doing. So what happens if you get the same exact offers, but by a computer, and you're told these are random? Um, so that was the second behavioral control that, that we had. Obviously, your self-interest um, motives will be the same. You still want to keep the money. Um, but reciprocity really makes no sense because, although I have to say I often feel like throwing my computer across the room, I know, I know it makes no sense. Um, and fairness and equity arguably are also not very important motifs because they don't carry the day in this case. What, this is a random generation. So in that case, the prediction would be um, that the right prefrontal cortex suppression may have a very different impact because you're not balancing the two um, principles. And indeed, the acceptance rate when you 
uh, modify the right uh, prefrontal cortex with the TMS versus the left or sham is not significantly different. So when playing with the computer, um, there is no reciprocity um, and uh, fairness principles to balance against your selfish, uh, uh, if you want to think about it that way, a sort of impulse to take. And there, the right prefrontal cortex doesn't kick in, essentially it doesn't come online. So what, what have we learned from this? Uh, so the implication from this is that, that indeed the right prefrontal cortex is apparently modifying your tendency, or controlling your tendency to impulsively accept what, at least in this task, would lead to a benefit to you, the, the selfish impulse to take the money. Most of the time, though, these tasks are not played one-on-one. -on -one. They are played in a whole group. They are all interacting with each other. And it is in that setting of sort of social context that the, that the, the behavioral um, signature of these tasks has been generally uh, figured out. And, and, the, and that's important because it turns out that it matters who exactly you play. It matters what you think about the other person. It matters whether you think that the other person is your boss, not your boss, dresses nicely, doesn't dress nicely, the gender and all this kind of stuff. So TMS, um, to modify activity in a given area, for that matter, functional imaging uh, to capture the activity, is difficult to do in the group with those interactions. But there is another technique of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation that can be used in that setting. Um, and so with uh, Daria, we, we try to play the ultimatum game, um, modifying right versus left prefrontal cortex activity on some of the subjects, and in others applying sham using transcranial direct current stimulation. So transcranial direct current stimulation it goes back not just to Faraday in the 1800s, but to Galvani and Aldini centuries before. Um, it's essentially faradizing the cortex. You apply um, a very small uh, one to two milliamp constant current through an anode and a cathode. You apply it either continuously for some period of time, or you put it on and then after a certain period of a few seconds you switch it off. Subjects feel this ramping up of current um, as an itching in the skin, and then they feel nothing else. Um, and they feel no difference if you apply a nodal stimulation or cathodal stimulation. Most of the current stays in the skin, but enough goes through that there is current in the cortex sufficient to not depolarize a neuron, doesn't cause a twitch, you don't see anything, but it changes the firing rate of the neurons. <coughs> Um, in, in fact, it appears to change the membrane potential of the neurons. And so when another input comes in, if you've applied anodal stimulation, there is an increase in firing. If you've applied cathodal stimulation, there is a suppression. So it's a pure neuromodulatory intervention. Um, and the subjects don't feel anything. They are truly blinded. And so you can therefore play it in this context of uh, applying it to different subjects in different ways and seeing uh, how they perform while their prefrontal cortex is modified in its activity. So, Daria had subjects play under either sham or cathodal TDCS uh, conditions. And what she found uh, was that subjects significantly accepted more offers um, when the, um, the cathodal stimulation was in place, remember suppressing the right prefrontal cortex, uh, then sham. This is 4 versus 16, the same condition as, as before. Um, the fairness judgment didn't change. Subjects, just like with the TDMS, still thought this is unfair, but just took it when the right prefrontal cortex was suppressed in its activity. And that was true for each subject when exposed to cathodal stimulation. So even though the likelihood that each one of us accepts or rejects is variable, any one of us appeared to be susceptible to accepting more when our right prefrontal cortex is suppressed. So from this ultimatum game experiments, we feel that we've learned a few things. First, it is possible to modify the response uh, to this sort of um, the high complex decision-making processes without altering the fairness judgment that is involved. 
suppressing the right prefrontal cortex increases the acceptance. And so it is consistent with the hypothesis that the right prefrontal cortex, the lateral prefrontal cortex, suppresses self-centered impulses. Now, is this just true for the ultimatum game, or can it be demonstrated in other, in other tasks? Of course, depending on the task conditions, there is a greater or lesser demand on impulsive fast decisions. And so arguably, um, it may have to do with the characteristics of the, of the task, how much the dorsal prefrontal cortex comes into play rather than the, the judgment per se. So we tried um, to explore this issue with a different task, uh, the, the risk task, Rogers' uh, risk task. In this case, subjects are presented with six boxes. The six boxes um, have different colors, two possible different colors. Each color is associated with a given uh, reward uh, amount that is uh, given to the subjects uh, and explicitly shown to the subjects. And the task is to find the winning token under any one of these boxes. But you're just the probability being identical that the winning token is in any one of these boxes, you're just supposed to give the color. So in this case, if you say green, you have five, six likelihood of being right. Um, but if you're right, you will only get 20 bucks. If, on the other hand, you say pink, you're much less likely to be right. But if you're right, you'll get 80. Um, so subjects know how much risk they're taking, how much reward they, they can expect from it, and they can take it into consideration in making their decision. So the level of risk can be calculated. The balance of reward is explicitly told. It's a bit of a no, not really re real life situation. Most of the time we don't have that, and we'll get back into that in a, in a second. Um, but you can then target the same sort of right prefrontal or left prefrontal as a control uh, area, and then have the subjects play for some period of time and, ask, uh, and see how modifying activity in the prefrontal cortex changes performance. And what you get is that when you have suppressed the right prefrontal cortex, subjects make significantly less points than they did, uh, that they did with the left or the sham condition. Because of that, they actually end up making significantly less money. And the, the reason is because they make significantly less low-risk choices. Um, so they uh, end up sort of risking more, presumably driven by the probability of reward being significantly higher. Right? So, so they, they see 80 uh, with pink is a much higher risk a chance, but higher potential reward uh, opportunity. And they go with that, even though, because of the way that the task is designed, if you do that, you end up losing. You get less points. Um, so suppression of the right prefrontal cortex essentially leads to increased risk-taking behavior in this, in this task. And because of the design of the task, that is not a good thing. Um, if the task is, is, ba is balanced the other way around, which we have done, then it still leads to impulsive behavior. It still leads to the, to the high risk uh, behavior being uh, the predominant with suppression of the right prefrontal cortex. But in that setting, subjects win. So it's not about whether they're winning or losing. It's about the apparently inability to control the tendency to go with the immediate reward and the high risk uh, when, when they are confronted with it in the absence of or in the face of suppression of the right prefrontal cortex. So that's, that's nice. But of course, from the neurological point of view, it'd be nicer to do it the other way around. It'd be nicer to decrease risk-taking behavior rather than to increase risk-taking behavior. Um, so can we modify activity in the right prefrontal cortex, increasing it rather than decreasing it? and modify behavior in the opposite direction. So Shirley Fecteau has been doing these studies, same task, 
Um, she's done it with TMS and with TDCS. These are the results of, of the TDCS. So instead of targeting the right prefrontal cortex with the cathode um, that would suppress the activity, she's applying the anodal simulation, which will increase the activity. And what happens then is that when the right prefrontal cortex is increasing its activity, subjects make significantly more low-risk choices. And again, they do that even if you modify the task and make this be a losing proposition. So it's not about the outcome, it's about the way that they go about doing the task. In this particular case, um, in the, this particular task, the points earn increase, they make more money with the low risk uh, choices, but you can play the other way around and people still go with the low risk choices. So increasing activity in the right uh, lateral prefrontal cortex decreases risk-taking behavior. So again, in the risk task, um, it appears that, that the lateral prefrontal cortex on the right side is uh, suppressing impulsive, self-centered behaviors. Um, but again, uh, as I mentioned before early, uh, briefly, this is a situation that is a bit artificial because you know the balance of your risk, and most of the time we don't in, in, in real life. Um, so what happens if you do a task where you cannot judge the risk, um, where you, at least you cannot be sure of it? And the balloon analog task allows you to, to do that. Um, this is a task in which <coughs> the subject sits in front of a computer screen. There is a button, and there is a balloon. And uh, you're told to push the button, and every time you push, the balloon will pump up. And with every pump, you'll collect some 25 cents or something like that. Um, and uh, at any point, you can stop, and whatever you've collected, you will move into permanent storage. But if you keep going and the balloon bursts, you will lose everything. Uh, so go at it. Now, you should know that each balloon has a different bursting point. They are completely unpredictable. You just need to decide whether you're willing to take the risk. So now this is a much more ecologically sort of valid thing because most of the time in real life we don't know what the risk of the situation really is until it's too late. Um, and this is exactly what happens here. But, but there are some sense that people develop, and much like in real life, they believe they actually can gauge how much they can keep going. They really can't, but they do pretty good. And, and uh, uh, overall, um, they pump a number of times, decide to move it into permanent storage or not. And if they don't and keep pumping again, they will, they will lose it. So what happens if you modify activity in the right or left prefrontal cortex in this setting. So, in this case, it's not so lateralized. Um, in fact, the, the effect is there whether you increase the right and decrease the left or vice versa. It doesn't really matter. It's about the balance between left and right that appears to be critical. But the net result is that the number of pumps is significantly less when you create an imbalance between the frontal lobes uh, in level of activity by increasing the left or, and decreasing the right or vice versa. It doesn't matter which direction you, you modulate it. Um, so if you apply anodal simulation to the left and cathodal to the right, or anodal simulation to the right and cathodal to the left, in any case, subjects become more risk averse, as it were, uh, and, uh, and end up pumping less number of times the balloon, and ultimately making less money. Um, so this is the total money earned is significantly less. So even though they see that they are making less money, and they've just played the game a number of times before, they still error on the side of making less choices when the stimulation is going on in a particular, in a particular way. So the idea is that whether you know the risk or don't know the risk, whether you can calculate the probability or not, um, the desire to go with the immediate reward, um, perhaps the selfish uh, desire, the self-centered behavior, 
um, is regulated, controlled by, the, or can be regulated and controlled by the lateral prefrontal cortex. In some people it is more so, in others it is less so. Um, but um, if that is the case, then modifying activity in the right prefrontal cortex can allow us to either exert less or more uh, control over these sort of self-centered behaviors, perhaps enhancing left reflective control over reflexive uh, mechanisms. Um, presumably, this is particularly critical in situations where there is an ambiguity conflict. Uh, so decisions or choice behaviors th where there is both cultural norms and social conventions that are opposite to the self-motivated, self-centered behaviors, like the ultimatum game. Um, in that situation, the regulation of the balance between those two, similar to what Plato was talking about, becomes really critical. And the argument is that this small experiments that I was showing you uh, reveal a, a critical role of the right prefrontal cortex in that setting. So what happens if you have a condition that uh, leads to right dorsal prefrontal cortex failure? If you have a trauma, a frontal dementia, a mood disorder, and so forth, where there is um, evidence that the right prefrontal cortex is dysfunctional, where the, the presumption would be that you would have impulsive, self-centered behaviors with disregard to, to social norm and, and conventions and, and uh, with disregard to, to other expectations. If that were the case, um, then there is a translational opportunity there. Uh, you could use the same type of modulation that I've shown you in normal subjects to target the lateral prefrontal cortex and increase the control that it exerts onto um, subcortical areas that presumably drive self-centered behaviors. So we have um, tried to, mod um, to model this and, and, and proof of principle this uh, with uh, addictive behaviors and eating disorders. Just want to, to show you some of those results quickly to give you a sense of, of what the, the findings look like. So um, Felipe Freni um, did a study um, in smokers. Um, initially with Q provoke nicotine craving and, and then with sort of just spontaneous uh, smoking behavior tracking uh, their, their smoking. In the Q provoke uh, nicotine craving, he presented a little movie clip um, of somebody smoking and uh, then applied TDCS the same way that I've described to increase the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex activity or left as a control or sham and then judge, uh, had the subjects judge again um, the amount of craving that they experience uh, to, the, to the same movies. And what he found is that uh, over time from the baseline to after the, the TDCS uh, in, in, in follow-up, there was, um, with the right dorsal prefrontal cortex uh, stimulation, but also with the left, a significant small effect, but a significant effect in decreasing the craving that actually sustained over time. So not only the right, as we had predicted, but in fact also the left, um, increasing activity in right or left or solar prefrontal cortex in each individual subject uh, led to a sustained um, demonstrable decrease in the craving that was induced by the Q. Paolo Boggio has uh, looked at the same type of design um, for alcohol craving and found essentially the same results that with the left or the right uh, solar prefrontal cortex stimulation, increasing activity in either one leads to a significant reduction in the craving as compared to sham. And John Campodron has looked at it in cocaine addicts, in uh, six cocaine addicts, um, and found with TMS rather than with uh, uh, TDCS um, that the left in this case uh, doesn't have the effect but that the right it significantly decreases craving and in fact sustains the suppression of the craving for five weeks on average after just a five sessions of, of stimulation. 
I find the, the results in obesity particularly interesting, so I want to spend a little bit more, more time with, with that. Um, and the, the argument uh, that Miguel Alonso has, has put forward is that, that eating behavior, of course, is uh, critically linked to homeostatic control and reward gratification, but that in humans, in addition, there is a whole cognitive aspect of uh, eating um, that uh, we often don't take into consideration in dealing with, with uh, eating behavior in obesity, and that relates to cultural, social messages that we send with uh, food. Uh, if you are from Spain and you come to my house uh, and uh, I put something in front of you to eat, if I don't, I'm committing sin, but if I do and you don't eating, you are committing sin. Uh, and so therefore, there is a whole elaborate sort of uh, behavior involved with this, which we as humans are able not only to use to our advantage, depending on, on the situation, but also make it trump all homeostatic control and reward gratification principles to the point of killing ourselves by not eating um, on the basis of motivated by um, you know, the political principles, um, something that, that seems to go at the very core against nature. So if the right prefrontal cortex in all these experiments is uh, playing a role in controlling self-centered behaviors, this is the ultimate uh, control mechanism potentially of self-centered behaviors where you have even a, a, a capacity to suppress uh, self-preservation. In fact, what Miguel has recently done is, is uh, look at um, how, is, how are food items uh, processed uh, by, by the brain when you present them in an fMRI context. He, had, uh, he has subjects present, uh, look at a, at a fixation point, then presents non-edible or edible items. Some are quote-unquote healthy, others obesogenic. And they can be presented for a very brief period of time, 16 milliseconds, or for longer periods of time, 200 milliseconds, followed by a mask. In a separate session, subsequently to the functional imaging that I'm going to show you, um, Miguel has uh, made sure that the subjects, when presented for the 16 milliseconds, truly don't see the objects. In fact, don't have a clue that there are any items presented. Um, this is shown here. They are completely at, at, at random as to whether or not they know that there was a picture presented there. The task for the subject is simply to respond whether these squares presented subsequently, uh, whether the field one was on the left or on the right. But what we're interested in is what is the brain activity related to these um, items, okay. specifically to the contrast between these two food items. Um, now, if you look at the brain activity related to the subliminal processing of obesogenic versus non-obesogenic food items, what you get is activity in the right or sort of prefrontal cortex. And if you define that region of interest and look at what is correlated with it, you find that any number of risk factors that track personality characteristics that would lead to obesogenicity, eating breakfast away, emotional eating, responses, low energy expenditure, family history of, of obesity, a, a number of items that are well recognized in behavioral tasks, uh, behavioral studies, to be predictors of personality, predictors of obesogenity, um, show a correlation with the, um, or inverse correlation, with the amount of activity in the right prefrontal cortex. So in other words, the less activity the subject shows, the more risk factors they have for obesogenic behavior. So if that is the case, what happens if you take any one of us and modify activity in the right prefrontal cortex, just like we were doing? Um, well, what happens um, is that, as uh, Felipe and Miguel have done together, that if you do the TDCS, you can basically, just cut through the chase, um, you can basically show that subjects, when the right prefrontal cortex is increasing its activity by exposure to the anode, but not the other way around. When the, when the left is uh, increased, you get a reduction in food craving when exposed to stimuli of food craving. 
You can also show that in a spontaneous ad libitum eating, uh, when they go into a buffet and just eat as much as they want, they actually eat significantly less. Um, and this is always at the same time, always with the same amount of food during the day. These subjects were admitted to the um, General Clinical Research Center. We know exactly that they have been eating the same amount of calories. And finally, which is very interesting too, when, when you look at the eye movements that these subjects make when exposed to these pictures, um, that they have to explore and answer a given question to an unrelated question to, it turns out that when they are expo have been exposed or are being exposed to the right anodal simulation, enhancing activity in the right prefrontal cortex, they show significantly less time um, fixating, looking at the food items um, than at other items. So, the idea is that um, the lateral prefrontal cortex um, appears across tasks, uh, perhaps to, to exert a repressive control onto self-centered behaviors. Might be thought of as a sort of switch between reflexive and reflective uh, modes of operation. And it appears that that insight lends itself to translational applications, um, where we can take those insights and apply them to uh, patient populations that have dysfunctions in the right prefrontal cortex uh, or behavioral dysfunctions related to um, a lack of uh, control of impulsive behaviors uh, in such a way that we might uh, offer them a, a, a helpful sort of therapeutic intervention. On the other hand, um, sort of in, in broader context, it, it appears that, that uh, we're able to influence and control behavior in, in humans with these brain stimulation techniques. Um, and of course, uh, having myself significant trouble controlling how much I eat, the temptation is, is uh, large to wake up in the morning and do some stimulation before I walk out the door. Uh, jokes aside, uh, it, would, it would seem that the temptation is there to, to define um, in some arbitrary way um, what are uh, uh, you know, desirable behaviors to modify and how to, how to uh, guide decisions. Um, it's an, all these techniques are, are, are sort of appear to be quite powerful in, in their ability to modify decisions. They're non-invasive, they're relatively simple. And so, as I was saying at the beginning, in, in, in ethical debate uh, would seem to be important to, to open up. Um, just want to finish up acknowledging again the people that have actually done all the work uh, and uh, hope that you have lots of questions. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks. That was an amazingly interesting talk. And I just had a question about the um, the craving measure and I guess the craving findings. Were you surprised in a way that stimulation of the right prefrontal cortex would, would actually um, affect ratings of craving, which I thought, oh, well, that would be a readout from the subcortical appetitive areas, right? I mean, unless craving is being interpreted as would you do it collectively, kind of a revealed preference? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so um, we, we just measured it with a visual analog scale. So, so basically, um, it's just you know, um, how much desire they felt uh, for whatever item, the, the smoking or the, or the, the alcohol and so forth. Um, what we what we had predicted is actually that the craving would be decreasing. Um, we, we had predicted the results, but but I think it was because we were just simply thinking of of the craving as a, as manifestation of the desire to do this, um, uh, rather than the sort of elaboration, like you're saying, of of uh, how to express the desire I have to to have. Um, I think that more sophisticated measures of craving, obviously 
could be done to try to parse out uh, what is what is really going on. Um, this was just a very preliminary sort of proof of principle, and, and uh, um, similarly, this is very much sort of triggered by the by the movie and immediately measured. So I think it would be interesting to see, you know, the 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 craving desire across situations that expose them to other stimuli and sort of get a better sense of of what is really modulated. But Your sort of headline story is the right side of the prefrontal cortex that matters, but your results suggest there's something more nuanced going on, yeah, that it sometimes is it's different. I'm having a little trouble understanding when the differences <laughs> matter. Could you help explain that sort of apparent subtlety? No, yeah, it's, uh, the subtlety is there. Um, we were hoping for slam dunk results, right? And, and uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, so it is, it is more complex, and, and, and to be honest, yeah, you didn't get it because I, I, I don't know myself. Uh, we looked at the tasks. I don't think it's anything specific of the, of the tasks that we could identify. We had not predicted, for example, that with the smoking and with the, um, with the uh, alcohol, uh, we would see sort of a bilateral effect with the food only unilateral. You can hand wave your way around an explanation, which I think is what we did in the papers, which is to say, you know, there's something different about craving um, that may be more engaging left side, because some aspects of it are more interpretative of what, what you're perceiving. Um, and that's the measure that we're having there, separate from the actual desire control that is more right-sided. Uh, but that's a testable hypothesis, but it's untested with these results. And so I, I, I don't know that that's really the, the, the full story. Um, it's not only in the application, in the translational applications, that the bilaterality comes out in those two craving studies where, where it could be related to the craving. Um, in one of the tasks uh, that, that uh, Shirley uh, did, the, the BART task, the effects were also bilateral. And, and so um, it wasn't really only, not only lateralized. Um, so the characteristics of the task seem to play a, a role. And presumably, that has to mean that there are specific um, underlying cognitive processes that, that may be more or less lateralized, or they may lateralize to one side or another. Um, and I think we need to try to disentangle that more. I don't have a better answer than that. Just, just perhaps to, to add one other thing. Um, there are some data, some proof of principle data from other groups also targeting um, only the left side, left versus sham, uh, for, for uh, smoking, for nicotine, and one for cocaine uh, showing beneficial effects too. So, so it may be that depending exactly on how you set things up and whether or not you look across the two sides, you might, you might have a greater laterality or not. Yeah. Hi. Um, did you find um, a threshold effect? Like, what is the least amount of stimulation that you could do and still see the effect? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so um, there are two sides to that. To that question that, that can be empirically tested. Uh, one is um, you can do a dose response kind of curve uh, within, within subject, and, and, uh, which would be very interesting. It's not a trivial experiment to do because uh, there is additive effects uh, from session to session. And so if you do the same subject, you need to wait long enough. Uh, otherwise, there will be a buildup of the effect of the second session onto the first. Uh, but that's. But, I mean, it can be solved, so, so it could be done. Um, the other way to do it is bank on the fact that the effects are individually different. So even though you stimulate the same uh, parameters, you modulate the amount of cortical activity differently. And so Miguel is, in fact, now doing a study um, currently, uh, running the study with the obesity using EEG and fMRI during the TMS to measure not only the effects that it has behaviorally, but what impact it has physiologically, with the aim of correlating the ultimate impact on the behavior with the physiologic impact, and, and see whether there is a, a correlation there. Um, but the second one is only slightly frivolous. Uh, when you talk about ethics, are you also interested in defining non-invasive? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You think this is invasive? 
Well, I can imagine that I that many people could yeah. think that that would be invasive. Yes. So, so the term invasive I use simply from the point of view of we're not opening the skin and the skull in targeting the brain. But the, obviously, it's invasive in the sense of invading into sort of personal spheres in, in defining in, in a sort of more, more uh, behavioral uh, uh, ways. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Or sitting near some gadget. Yeah, but but that's why I'm saying that in the sense of of the of neurosurgically speaking, it's non-invasive, even though it clearly is modifying brain activity. We know that, and and so in that sense, it is doing something to the brain. Um, so there is that ethical aspect of of uh, are those effects safe in in their own right? I think that there is a lot of data over the last twenty years on on uh, non invasive in this sense non invasive uh, and in general on brain simulation to have a sense of of what if any long term effects might be there and uh, if you if you apply the stimulation in a therapeutic uh, aim, multiple sessions in a row with additive effects, there will be lasting impact. But if you, if you just apply the stimulation one session, short session for a sort of quote-unquote diagnostic effect, like in this experiments I was showing you, there are no, no lasting effects. Um, so in that sense, I, I feel comfortable with the, with the safety of it. Um, but of course, the impact that, that modifying the behavior of a person may have on that person in a more sort of global sense, it becomes an interesting question and uh, I, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, Alvaro, um, throughout the talk, you link the ideas of impulsivity and self-interest together uh, yeah. in the sense that a number of your tasks actually uh, sort of uh, if a person is acting in their short-term self-interest, they're also acting impulsively. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering to what degree you think those, those notions are actually linked, whether you thought about sort of pursuing experiments that might dissociate those ideas or perhaps manipulating impulsivity in a way that actually works against this notion of self-interest. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I... It didn't come across uh, properly because I didn't mean to link them. Um, I, you know, some of these tasks actually don't, dis don't disentangle them. And so because of that, um, the fast response, impulsive response in that sense, um, ends up being also self-interest driven or, or maps to the self-interest. Um, but that's not true of all the tasks, and so you can you can separate some of the tasks. So, for example, the fast response of uh, you know, depends on how you sep how you define it in the bar. Uh, you could say you know I'll take the the money now that I have a little bit um, is uh, is more self interest, uh, uh, whereas the the keep on pushing you could I mean is that impulsive or is it not? Uh, um, so so the the speed of response either one of the two, it doesn't really get modified by the simulation. So I, I don't think it is the, the impulsivity per se that is being modified by the, by the simulation, but rather the, the, how much self-centered motifs are weighed by the, by the individual in, in performing the task. In some of the tasks, like the ultimatum game, it turns out that when you um, are driven by self-impulses um, of keeping the money, you also respond faster, and so it looks like, like it's impulsive. Um, we've tried to, to, Daria has gone on to do some tasks um, looking at, um, at just the you know, fast versus slow decision making, so, so where you have to weigh more information, um, but then the decision is made, uh, or, or do, do so quicker. Um, and there is some literature that in the, in the sort of faster, more impulsive, not independent of, of self-motifs um, tasks, there is more activity in the prefrontal cortex as well on functional imaging. McClure and others have, have shown that. Um, and so in that setting, the TMS uh, didn't affect the decision. Um, it did affect the response time, but it didn't affect the, the decision. So I, I don't think that this is about impulsivity to, to answer your, your question, but, but about the content of the, of the decision. Um, but sometimes it's not... not possible to disentangle with this task.
In, uh, in the ultimatum game, uh, the reward is measurable. Yeah. And it's money. Yeah. Uh, but in the real world, rewards can be complex. Mm -hmm. So uh, intangible, perhaps, like uh, helping a blind person cross a road. How would you account for that? Yeah, so, so th I think that, that uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, so in as much as there is a reward that uh, is translated to a benefit of the individual, I would argue that, that the same holds true, that, it, that this is not just about money. Um, and, and hence, uh, the argument that it applies to, to behaviors related to eating what is in front of you or uh, taking the pleasure related to the smoke or the alcohol immediately or whatever. Um, and uh, um, so in as much as um, crossing the, helping somebody cross the street leads to a, a benefit, recognition, being told how nice you are, whatever, um, I would argue that that, that would, would be following similar, similar um, sort of regulatory um, you know, controls. Um, and so I would say that the right prefrontal cortex in that setting um, sort of is still exerting the same control on your drive to do what you think is, is the, the thing that will bring you the reward. Um, in this case, helping somebody cross the street. Um, it can also be that, uh, it can also be that people vary in their uh, sense of ethics. So it's not necessary that uh, the same uh, result may hold for in either case. Yeah, Th there is no question that there is huge inter-individual variabilities in all yes. these measures and, and, and in all these personal characteristics. And, and, uh, um, and I think there are, uh, uh, arguably, I would say, because the amount of right prefrontal control onto subcortical structures may be different in different people. and, and uh, um, so these measures are all within subject, right? So, so whatever you do, if I activate your right prefrontal cortex more, it seems like you do differently. Um, but um, which is why I am saying that it opens up a whole ethical debate. Yes. I think there is great value in the fact that some people are different than others and, and uh, that we are not sort of a nice homogeneous, everybody, same amount of whatever, altruism. And, okay. and, uh, um, so. Um, so that's that's in fact part of part of the concern. Uh, who defines what is appropriate, and and, yes. the, and how do you how you know, how do you hold people how to it? it? Um, but it is within subject that, that I'm talking about, sort of modifying the decisions like that. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder. Um, you know, if I were to summarize what you're saying, it, it, to, if I had to tell someone else what I heard today, I would say that you, you have done these beautiful studies that show up, up regulating the right or the left prefrontal cortex um, reduces the tendency to uh, be attracted to hedonic stimuli. But what, what is going on there? I mean, why would that be happening? I mean, do you have a theory? Is it like, are they thinking more about their future and saying, I shouldn't do this now because the future will be bad for me? Why is it that upregulating the right, you know, such a gross yeah, intervention very. should be so, you know, uniformly powerful in, in producing the same result? Um, well, it, I would turn it around. I, I would say, um, I mean, I think w we have the same sort of interest in, in, in pursuing the, the question. The, the, the question is, um, to me, is given this, these results, which are you know, surprisingly strong uh, to, to me, um, there should be, there, there is now a whole reason to start trying to disentangle what is really going on um, at two levels, I think, both at the, at the biological level. I mean, what is the circuitry that actually accounts for this? What are the areas that when you modify the right prefrontal are being impacted, right? So, so um, if you, so Mark Halko is now in the lab sort of targeting the right prefrontal cortex um, or the left with the TMS and, and looking at what activation do we see as a bolt evoke it changes. And how is that change by engaging the subject in a task like this uh, when you apply the stimulation? Because it turns out that the connectivity, the, the bolt, the induced connectivity, um, is, uh, is highlighting 
probably functional connectivity. It's not just the anatomy that, that matters, but the state of the connectivity matters. And so if you're engaging in one task that is going to demand a decision from you down the road, he's seeing different activity that if the subject is addressed, which is not surprising, but, but it may hopefully allow us to find out what is the target area of that, that modulation? What is the neurobiology of it? And at the same time, it, it, in parallel, it's interesting to ask the question, so, so when you've modified the activity in that manner and you decide to go with a different decision, what is driving that decision? What is the, the cognitive process that the subjects? The, the subjects are quite blind to it. I mean, so, so you tell them and they, they, their arguments are much, I mean, I don't think that that's very surprising either. They tell you, oh yeah, he was a complete, in the ultimatum game, complete jerk. Can't believe he did that. Um, offer only two or whatever. You say, well, why did you accept it? And so, well, it just made sense. But a week ago, you didn't accept any of those offers. No, I didn't feel like it then, but it was the right thing to do now. Okay. There is no link established even to the stimulation. A few subjects, when you go through this sort of questioning session, at the end of it will say, well, I presume it must have been whatever you were doing. Yeah. But, but there is no insight whatsoever. It's, it's, so, so basically, we need to design tasks that will, will capture the, the, the phenomena that are, you know, with other tasks, uh, presumably, try to characterize also what else is going on. Um, and we've tried to do some things. So for example, we know that the go, no, go, for example, is, is not affected. Um, so it's, it's not simply a, a sort of um, across the board inhibition kind of uh, regulation, that's not it. It's, it's more complex than that, at least for the same amount of simulation that, we, that we're applying. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Well, if there are no more uh, questions, uh uh, let's uh, thank Alvaro again, and you, if you have other questions that you want to talk to him, uh, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one about, there's a reception uh, just outside here. Is that right?